Hello, everyone. This is the Free American Press with your host, Alexander. Today, we are having Patrick Vieira on the show of SPTV on YouTube. Hello, Patrick. Thank you for being on the show. Hey, Alex. How are you doing? Thank you for having me and um, great show. I love what you do. Oh, thank you. Uh, so can you tell the viewers a little bit about yourself? Yeah, uh, my name is Patrick Vieira. I'm originally from Hawaii. I've lived there all my life up until about uh, 2005 when I made my way over into Singapore. So it wasn't until I was 18 when I actually left the first time to go into the, the Air Force, came home, did all kinds of things. I mean, worked in lumber yards, worked as a bartender, worked um, fast food places in high school. And, and then eventually you step up, step up, and you find your way into another country and you, you really um, see the world for what it is and uh, try to find your place in it. Wow, that's great. So what first got you interested in precious metals? Uh, that's a great question. Um, what happened was my wife and I were having breakfast one morning and she tells me, you know, you always help other people to make money. So you got to do a little bit better for us. <laughs> so I'm like, okay. And she tells me to go ahead and pray on it. And, and I did that evening. And the next morning I come back to the breakfast table and, and I tell her, I say, okay, well, we got to start buying silver and gold, specifically silver. And she's like, what do you mean? And I tell her, well, you told me to pray on it. I pray on it. And this is what I got. And at that time, I, I didn't know anything about silver and gold, but I, I trusted it. And the more I got into it, the more I found that, you know, this is absolutely the right thing to do. And I will say that I've, I've never bought an ounce as an investment. I've always bought it as an insurance. Yeah, that's great. Wow. Okay. Uh, so which commodity once used as money is the best to invest in, you think? Um, commodity, I'm, I'm still looking at gold and silver. I, I do prefer silver mainly because when you look at things like the silver to gold ratio, uh, you see right now, it's still a very good time to be buying silver considering the, the historical ratio is about 16 to one, 20 to one. Some might say, uh, some miners are telling us it's coming out of the ground at eight to one. And so you have a lot of upside with silver. And besides that, it's, it's just used in so many things. I mean, when you look at all of this, you know, uh, green energy and whatnot coming online and coming up to speed, it's going to be using quite a bit of silver, quite a bit of copper. So I, I think with silver, you're definitely in the right space. So what do you think of copper? I think copper, you're definitely in the right space too. Um, copper, no doubt, it'll be used more than silver, um, especially in wiring windings for motors and things like that. Uh, they call it the electrification of everything. So as we move forward, we're going to see more and more electric, um, not devices, we already have those, but you're, you're going to see more green energy power coming in through batteries, perhaps more than the old style turbines from electric power plants. Yeah, I think you're uh, definitely right on the copper because we need copper for the industrial age that we're in. And one thing I was looking at, I, I guess the copper to gold ratio, is actually like at the lowest since it has been. Like the copper went down in price since basically Brenton Woods. So what do you think about that? Um, you know, to be honest, I, I haven't followed copper to gold ratio too much, but I, I would say absolutely you you you're probably spot on with that. I mean, again, considering the industrial usage of copper that that's never gone away. And if anything, it's gotten much greater since I guess we can go back to Brenton Woods or earlier. Yeah, definitely. So what commodity do you think is most undervalued out of all of them? I, I'm looking at two. I'm looking at, of course, silver, and I'm also looking at nickel. And again, nickel, because when we go back to the whole electrification of everything, uh, when we go to things like electric vehicles and how nickel is, is used in the electric vehicle batteries, uh, before it was like a six to one to one ratio where it was six parts nickel one part cobalt one part lithium now it's eight one one so they're using more nickel in these batteries where it's eight parts nickel one part copper one part lithium and the funny thing is with nickel you have one nickel price but you have two distinct classes of nickel class one and class two and it's only class one that can be used for electric vehicle batteries so 
even saying that, it, it's almost a bargain right now to go ahead and get in on that class one nickel while it has a class two, perhaps a class two nickel price. And it's all time high was about 50,000 per ton. And I think we're only at about 16, 17,000 per ton. So there's a lot more upside to nickel. Okay, so is nickel worth more than copper? Yeah, yeah, it's it's worth more than than copper. Um, I, as mentioned, it's about seventeen thousand per ton. Copper, it's not not quite there. It's 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 not there yet. I don't believe it's there yet. Yeah, so definitely. copper. I, yeah, I guess I, I can backtrack and say yes. Copper definitely has an upside, a lot more upside as well. Yeah, definitely. Okay, so do you think the banks are manipulating? You know metal prices like copper gold and silver and others yeah yeah without question um you know we we see it over and and over and over um it's come out headline after headline after headline how you have the banks manipulating either libor or they're manipulating the spoofing the precious metals market so it's it's no longer a question uh it, it's an absolute it is it is happening and they do manipulate prices to their benefit. I see. So do you think banks should be abolished to end that problem? I think in some ways we need banks. If anything should be abolished, it should be the Fed. I'm, I'm all for getting rid of the Fed and the Fed. I mean, honestly, Alex, I can't see why a country would job out their, their money, their currency, to another company to to handle. I mean, it's the same like, can you imagine the judicial system where they had a, a third party, a corporation of judges who who judged and ruled for every case in, in America? You don't do that, right? But yet you you give out your, your money, you outsource your money. And, um, you know, they say there are good reasons for that. But, um, you know, considering what the Fed has done or has not done since 1913, uh, I'm, I'm just, I'm just not buying it. I, I think it's time for, for the Fed to go. So what will we replace the Federal Reserve with, or will we not replace it with anything? Well, that's a good question. Um, you know, I think we've kind of went a bit past the point of no return. Uh, and what I mean by that is once things like Bitcoin came into play and, you know, we had people freely trading, uh, Bitcoin as a currency to, to buy things without central banks or any bank involved. I think that opened up the door where now you look at central banks and, and they have things like central bank digital currencies, which are going to come in to replace more than likely cash and coin at some point. So I think the Fed took its cue uh, from what went on with, with cryptocurrencies and, and they're going to bring it in and once they do that, and if we do end up in a position where we don't have any more cash and coin, there's there's no turning back already. So I think we well, we may have crossed that line already. So you think the United States and other world governments are moving to change the monetary system fairly soon? Yeah, absolutely. I, I well, if you when you listen to these central banks, you know they're always in fact they're telling you. You know, central bank digital currencies, CBDCs, they're always talking about it. Um, if they're talking about it, they have it. I, I think it's already there. It's just a matter of how, how are they going to get us from this monetary system to that monetary system? And a lot of guys think it's going to be some type of inflation where a lot of people are going to get financially hurt. They're going to feel the financial pain and they're going to beg the central banks to help us, help us, and they'll come in with their digital currency. Okay, so why do you think they want to switch to a digital currency? What are their reasons behind it? Full control. Once they have that digital currency, it's full control. I mean, you, you can imagine, let's say, health insurance companies, they're going to go to Congress. So this is for the U.S. anyway. Health insurance companies, they may go to lobby Congress and say, hey, uh, cost of healthcare is way too much. Uh, you got guys out there with, let's say, let's say things like diabetes, and they will pass. Let's say perhaps they will pass something where, you know, because you you're all digital now, no cash and coin. You go to a Seven Eleven, and you want to buy yourself a, a can of Coke, and the clerk, you know, he he rings up your card or whatever, he scans your card, whatever it is, and he says, "Oh, sorry, Alexander, you you can't have that Coke. You're you can't sell you Coke." Or 
you know, perhaps you, you got an SUV and you're filling it up with gas and you're going to go on a trip, stop by a 7-Eleven and they tell you, sorry, Alex, you're over your allotment of, of, of gallons for the month. We're going to have to charge you a higher price. We're going to have to tax you a higher price. So, I mean, once these things happen and, and not to mention when you go and play, uh, let's say Texas Hold'em with your friends and family over the weekend, how are you going to pay each other? The central bank is going to know you transferred some money to someone else. And there may be some type of regulation where you have to uh, state what it was that you, that you bought. Maybe you even have to scan something at that point. Wow. So it sounds like a pretty draconian world where they basically can tax you for everything. Am I right? Yeah, and I think that's the plan because you, you just go back to what's happening right now with all the stimulus checks. Federal Reserve has made it clear that these are loans. Yeah, they're loans. They're not gifts. And so it's going to have to be paid back. And, you know, if you're the government, the easiest way is, okay, you know, if we do go ahead and, and let the central banks go with these digital currencies, then every single time a transaction is made, you can collect your taxes right then and there. You don't have to wait till April 15th or for people to file. You just tax every transaction. Wow. So basically what you're saying is a world without privacy. Yeah. And I think we're almost there. Um, when, you, when you look at my generation, we had these things called phone books. I don't know if you've come across phone books. Yeah, I've books. seen them, yeah. <laughs> okay. So we've had phone books and my parents, at least, we paid the phone company to keep our number unlisted. So all these old folks, they're going to know what that is, where we pay to have our number unlisted. In other words, we wanted some sense of privacy. But previous generations, you, you look at them and they've grown up in social media with Facebook. They share everything. They share everything about their lives. So they may not have that same definition or sense of privacy as, as we do. So or my older, older generation. So when these things happen and central banks come out with these digital currencies and lack of privacy, for us old guys, it's, it's very severe, very significant. For younger people, they're really not going to see what the big deal is. So we definitely have a, a, a gap in the way the generations think. Yeah. So do you think uh, all cryptocurrencies are basically aiding in the social credit system? Um. That's a great question. I think, I, I mean, if we go to social media, I think it's social media that, that has gotten us to, to, to give everything, give everything freely. Uh, with cryptocurrencies, I think it's more, wait, I may be running off, off course here. What's your question again? So basically, do you think cryptocurrencies are aiding in the social credit system? Yeah. Well, um, no, I don't. Because I think they're still their own animal. Cryptocurrencies, they're outside of the banking system. They're not centralized. Most of them are not centralized. So I don't think they're really aiding. But I do think the Fed and central banks have seen how this generation of younger people, middle-aged people, they like their cryptocurrency. So they're getting, uh, um, they're getting quite fond of it. And so, again, as I say, when that switch does move over, where we do go into central bank digital currencies, you're going to have some guys who say it's not a big deal and some guys who are, are very adamant about not doing it. So I think uh, in some ways, cryptocurrencies, it was the training wheels. It was the training wheels for central bank digital currencies. So one thing that I have been uh, seeing with Bitcoin, and it brings me to my next question, why is every purchase made from Bitcoin put onto a public blockchain database for anyone to look at? Why do you think they did that? Uh, it's a great question. You know, I wish I were more well-versed in Bitcoin. Uh, my limited understanding is it's because they, they want people with a certainty to know that, that uh, this amount of Bitcoin is in the system and here it is moving from point A to point B to point C. And, and it's a way to, um, to put this on a ledger where everyone can, can see it. And um, basically... That, that's my understanding of it. Everything is transparent with it. Okay, so do you think that transparency can be used for track and tracing of people and what they're buying? I think at some point, yeah. I mean, um, if you look at the bills that went through Congress last year, a lot of them had to do with regulations on cryptocurrency. 
So at some point, um, it does look like Congress or governments, they are going to slap some type of regulation on cryptocurrencies where it's going to have to be made known what they were used for. Okay, so that brings me to my next question. Who do you believe made Bitcoin, the anonymous Japanese man, Satoshi Nakamoto, or the United States government? Oh, man. Oh. Um, I think it definitely has elements where um, one man could not do it on his own. I, I think there are elements where he was helped. Uh, who he was helped by, that's the question. You know, I, I simply don't think one guy created this on his own and had the muscle to to push it out into the world and have the adoption that it did, it, it had to have some help behind it. So I, I do think there were elements of, of government behind it. Yeah, one thing I've been seeing is that, you know, the big, so uh, you know, big news companies like CNN and others have been really promoting Bitcoin, like people that use their stimulus checks to buy Bitcoin, and they haven't been saying anything about gold and silver. Do you think there's a reason for the positive press coverage of Bitcoin? Yeah, it's another great question. Um, you know, I, I guess you can just go back to recently with uh, what Jerome Powell said uh, when he said Bitcoin is uh, it's a speculative asset. And I think he even said it's better than gold or something like that. Um, I kind of see it as for years now, uh, the Fed, the government, they want you in anything else but gold. They wanted you in the stock markets. They can definitely control you that way. They wanted you equity markets, things like that. And then Bitcoin comes along and it's, you know, it, it, some people say it is very easy to pull the plug on Bitcoin. So if you pull the plug on the markets, pull the plug on cryptos, you're going to have a lot of people in a world of hurt, you know, trying to have some type of currency. And the thing is, if you have gold and silver, you, you're outside of the financial system. Same with Bitcoin, you are outside of the financial system as well. Uh, but, you know, for some reason, they do not want you to go into gold and silver, but yet they are the very ones who are buying gold to hold in reserves. So don't do what they tell you, just do what they do. Yeah, one of the things that I was uh, looking into, a lot of people say that, you know, Max Kaiser and a lot of others say that, that Bitcoin is basically digital gold. It's decentralized. But when I think of that, I usually think, oh, it's decentralized, but it's on the internet. And isn't anything on the internet basically centralized? And when I look at gold and silver, you can use that without you know, the government knowing or hackers knowing or people online knowing. So do you think gold and silver is decentralized? Yeah, yeah. It is decentralized where you know, you can go ahead and buy it and um, it's not on any ledger. It's, it's not on, you know, any government balance sheet or anything like that. Um, it is decentralized. And, um, you know, with gold and silver, from what I see, people don't buy it to, to hide anything. People are buying it as a hedge against inflation, as a hedge against currency. So, you know, there's no real, you know, bad things that are going on. And, and, you know, it's the same. I feel it's the same with Bitcoin because you have Janet Yellen and, and others who are saying, you know, it's, it's only criminals who use Bitcoin or things like that. And I, I don't believe that either. You know, I think people are, are just tired of what's happening and, and they see opportunities and other things. Yeah. So do you think um, cryptocurrency is a new scheme just to make money or a currency out of nothing? Well, it's sort of, it, it's, it's what's been happening with it. And I mean, um, you know, you can go ahead and uh, use it unregulated and use it as a currency. Um, you know, it's, it, it's just odd when, when you get into those arguments though about scarcity, because, you know, that was one of the, the points where Bitcoin is better than, than fiat because fiat the Fed can keep printing it uh, with Bitcoin let's say when that last Bitcoin is mined, all you're going to do is move the decimal point, which is to me the equivalent of printing money. You know, you're just going to move that decimal point because it's going to have to account for, for everything in the world and you can't print or mine anymore. So what do you do? You move the decimal point. And to me, it's the same as printing money. It's just one is going to the left in a positive way and one is going to the right in a negative way. 
Yeah, definitely. And it just seems to me like it's just, uh, you know, a new theory of making money out of nothing because yeah. say if you wanted to make a hundred cryptocurrencies, like whatever coin you wanted to do, you know, you could get people to pay you whatever amount of money, you know, you thought for it and people might buy it. So do you yeah. think that's just all part of that? Um, you know? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I think it's part of it. I, I think someone said something along the lines, like, um, you know, every other coin that came out after Bitcoin, it all had an intention to make money where Bitcoin's intention was to be used as money where the others were uh, in some way, shape or form was meant to make money. So Bitcoin, it's a bit of a difference between a lot of other coins. Well, you do agree, though, the people who own the most Bitcoin, though, especially in the very beginning, have made the most money out of anybody with cryptos. Yeah, that, that is true. Um, you're absolutely correct there. And, and again, with what you're saying, that's a strange part because, you know, it's these very guys who are saying, you know, Bitcoin is money, Bitcoin is a currency. But the thing is, you can't have a currency if, if you don't want to circulate it. If you're just going to buy it and hold it, it cannot be a currency. It's like saying you and I created a uh, $10. You have five and I have five and, and some other guy comes in and, and he wants to buy some and you won't sell yours. I won't sell mine. So how does it ever become currency for that third guy who, who wants to buy some? So, you know, in, in, in another odd way, they want it to be currency, but at the same time, they don't want it to circulate. They, they want to hold it because it's a speculative asset. Mm. So basically what you're trying to say that cryptocurrency is basically uh, imagination um, where it's not real. It's just part of people's imaginations. Is that what you're trying to say? Uh, great question. I mean, I, I think, you know, it, it is real because there are use cases for it and it can actually do something for you uh, but the part where there's nothing behind it and i i mean i'll just be honest i don't buy the argument that um you know the um the the value of it is is because you it takes energy to produce it or things like that um i i, I don't buy that you know because energy energy is, is in everything so you you can't say that um Bitcoin has a value because of the, the energy that's put into it. So, um, you know, I'm just, a lot of things they say, I, I don't really follow it or, or accept it. Yeah, definitely. So why do you think, you know, governments, banks, and people who made cryptocurrency like to make money out of nothing? Because <laughs> it's the easiest thing to do. I mean, especially if you're the guy who's, who's creating the money. Um, you can do a lot of things and more than that, you can have a lot of power. Um, but to unfold that question a little bit more, when we did have things like the gold standard, it worked. And a lot of people say it failed. It didn't fail. What failed were the politicians who chose not to be responsible. And then eventually who chose not to have gold backing the money, which enabled them to freely, you know, have programs and have that money printed and get reelected because people say, hey, this politician is working for me. I got this, 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 and that. And I didn't have to pay for anything. This politician didn't raise taxes. And so, you know, when you have that ability to, to print money or to, to, to have, you know, create bills in Congress to, uh, to put out some treasuries or whatnot and get the Fed to, to, to buy them and, and give you money or give Congress money, there's no accountability, no responsibility. And, and that's really why we are where we are today. So do you think people in government are in, in on the scheme to make money out of nothing, to enrich themselves? Oh, yeah, of course, of course. Um, you know, you, you, you can't, um, you just have to look at the books. You know, when you see a politician go in and, you know, he had really nothing when he went in office and then he's a multimillionaire in just a few years. You don't get that on a public servant salary. So you know there are, are deals being cut. You know there are things that are going on. And, um, you know, we've gotten to a point where, you know, they no longer serve us. You know, we're here to serve them. And um, it's, it's just ultimate corruption right now. They, they want the power. It almost seems like a form of slavery in a way. 
that they are able to be able to print out all the money in their printing presses to be able to enrich themselves and then force the people just to use, you know, these tokens yeah. that they make like the company store. Do you agree with that? Yeah, it is. It is slavery. And uh, it's even robbery when <laughs> when inflation comes into play and it, it steals your purchasing power. Um, it, it is slavery, you know, and to expand on that a little bit, as, as I mentioned earlier, when the Federal Reserve says these are loans, all this stimulus, and it needs to be paid back. See, the Fed cannot give these loans unless there's some type of collateral. And then you have people who are saying, why should we even pay taxes anymore if the Fed is just giving money all over the place to corporations and banks? Why do we pay taxes? Well, in my opinion, I can't prove this, but in my opinion, we pay taxes because the collateral or these loans are you and me. You and me are these loan, the collateral for the loans that will have to pay these loans back. And that's why we have taxes. Yeah, you actually raise a really good point. Uh, one of my friends, Jordan Maxwell, actually told me that your body's on the New York Stock Exchange with your social, um, your social credit number. If you call the New York Stock Exchange, your body's wow. worth so-and-so amount of money if you actually call them and give them your number. Uh, have you ever heard anything about that? You know, years ago, uh, Alexander, I've, I've heard, you know, these types of things. And, and this is why the reason, or this is the reason why your name is in all capital letters, um, because you are in some way a corporation or, or something like that. That's, that's just the way you're, you're seen um, as, as um, some type of a, a token or, or something. So, yeah, I've, I've heard, I've heard these, um, these ideas before. Okay, so what do you think is our best course in stopping this slavery bondage of the human race to this small group of elite bankers? Yeah, I think first thing we, we have to understand is um, basically what is money and how our money was taken away from us. Uh, we look at history of how governments do have a history of debasing money and, and taking the people's money away. And we need to first understand that. And um, I think once we understand this, then we start to understand the value of things and including ourselves, because right now our, our time, our labor, you know, those are important and it's what we get currency for. So if we understand what money is, we understand the value and then we, it starts to unfold into other things. You know, you, you, um, you understand other aspects, I, I guess, you know, when, when you, I guess a gallon of milk, you don't see it as today it's $4 and, you know, tomorrow it's $4.50. You see it as this is what it is. And it's because our money is not, um, it's not a store of a good store of value. I, I guess I would say it's not a, because it deflates or right. inflates, you know, we, we don't understand that part of it. You know, we just, we don't see the gallon of milk as a gallon of milk. We just see, okay, it's today, $4 tomorrow, four fifty, And, and we don't have the concept of, of value and sometimes that leads even into like self-worth uh, what you should be getting paid for what you do um, again your time and, and your labor so we I think we first need to understand that yeah definitely so do you believe inflation is a tax yeah yeah it's it, it's a tax partly a tax but I think it's it's also a, a mistake <laughs> where central banks just uh, they were overly involved. Their mandate is really just um, uh, un their mandate is really just employment and um, what do you call it? purchasing? I forget what it is. Now. They only have power. yeah, they only have two mandates: uh, maximum employment and um, uh, purchasing power, something like that. I forget what it was. I should know this, but they are they are so out of bounds already doing all of these other things. You know, stimulus checks, all of this other stuff, uh, keeping zombie companies afloat alive things like that um it's not their mandate you know they've they've become judge and juror of which businesses survive and which businesses are going to fail yeah and you right. know oh wait i was going to say i was going to say it's maximum employment and price stability oh wow yeah that uh definitely makes sense you know one thing i was going to add too is that in venezuela basically hugo chavez and his cronies were able to steal all the money from all the people basically he first thing he did was take all the gold from the gold reserves mm -hmm. to 
uh, put it in his own pockets. But then he just inflated the currency to take away all their purchasing power and give it to him. And now Hugo Chavez's daughter is one of, is one of the richest women in the whole world. And now I was actually uh, reading that they're basically having China come down to Venezuela, which has about the most gold in the world, most oil, and they're actually shipping the gold back to China. So what do you think of that? Uh, well, China, one thing with China, they, as Gerald Salente says, they're, they're about business, and, and that is true. But China is also in it for the long game. Uh, they don't they don't do things necessarily short term. They're always looking long term, long range. So if they're doing things like you know, accumulating gold, which they have been doing now for for decades. They're doing it for a reason, and a lot of people do speculate that reason is they want to come out with either some type of gold back one or some type of gold back digital currency. And and if they do, uh, you're going to see a lot of currencies, a lot of countries really flock to that gold back currency. And um, the reason being because of that, that whole stability and, and um, you know, it, it being a backing, not, it's not anymore, you know, backed by nothing. And, and I think this is something that governments really want, but their politicians just aren't able to do. So when you have a country like China who can come in and do it, um, I think it's, um, it, it brings in a new dynamic and something that I think the, the U.S. really does not want to see. So do you, you think China's got to go back to the gold standard? Is that what you're thinking? I, I think in, in some way, shape or form, I, I think they may. Um, I don't think it's going to be a, a classic one to one. It may be a fraction um, that fraction. should also. Yeah, maybe like the one fortieth or whatever it might be. But that should also push up the gold price. And even if you look at the, the IMF and the SDRs, uh, when they included China, the Chinese currency, I think back in 2016, gold is also in there. And, and at that time, my thinking was, okay, they brought in China because China has most of the gold. So they, they want to have China in there because IMF and SDR also has gold as one of the the currencies in that basket. Oh, okay. So do you think if China switched to a, um, you know, a gold again, do you think that'll start a war with the United States? <clears throat> That's a great question. I, I think, um, I don't think the rest of the world will, will go for it. Meaning if, um, if, if, if the U S got upset with that, I don't think the rest of the world is going to be agreeable with the U.S. because the rest of the world, um, they're actually tired of the way the U.S. weaponizes the dollar. Um, and they would, I think, accept, they would be accepting of, of some type of currency that had a, a gold backing to it. So I, I think they would gravitate towards China and away from the U.S. And, and the U.S. would really find itself um, in its own corner at that point. Oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And we also see tensions rising, you know, between Russia and the United States, you know, United States with China. So do you think there is going to be a World War III soon? Or what are your thoughts on that? You know, that's, that's a great question. Um, I think if you just look at the history of, of the U.S., the recent history, um, it's pretty much always been in some type of war, small scale war, nothing, nothing world war, but it's getting to a point where countries are going to have to go over resources. Like I just mentioned, nickel. Um, there's a whole lot of other commodities in the ground, you know, whether it's copper, nickel, like we said, uh, whatever it may be, gold, silver, uh, resources that, that they're going to need, lithium. I think it's getting to a point where, you know, countries are really, you know, going to have to maneuver themselves to get these resources and it may it may one day come to that where you know a country might need something and they can't get it because another country has it and it's an item of national security and and uh, you're going to see frictions start to arise yeah. yeah that definitely makes sense what you're saying because china's already siphoning off resources from venezuela and you know most of the copper comes out of chile so a lot of the a lot of the materials are coming out of South America. 
So do you think there's going to be more Chinese involvement in South America in the coming years? Yeah, yeah, without question. And, um, you know, again, mainly it's because, as Gerald Salente says, the business of China is, is business. You know, China's working to, to do business. But I do have to say it's almost getting monopolistic as well at this point. And this is where I do think other countries need to really, you know, roll out of bed, wake up and look at look at who they're dealing with. You know, and, and I think, you know, we we all need to pause and step back. And if anything, uh, the virus showed us that because we depend so much on, on China to manufacture everything. Uh, when they went down, you saw the world basically slow down. You know, it's like the world forgot how to manufacture and make things because they left it pretty much all up to one country. And so, you know, with this, it's the same thing where I think, you know, countries need to understand it is getting a bit monopolistic. and. But again, it comes back to politicians, you know, if they've cut some deal where, you know, they're just going to go ahead and go with it because their family and generations are set up for life, then we got a problem again. Yeah, definitely. Do you think um, the United States in particular should go back on the gold standard? You know, I, I think we would or, or we should. But if we did, gold would definitely have to be valued higher or revalued higher to account for all the the money that's been printed, I think you would see a world that would be much happier with the U.S. Uh, seeing that the U.S. Is, is taking, you know, some type of responsibility. Uh, when Obama was president, I would always tell guys, you know, hey, he should just come on one evening, go on the news and, and just say, hey, you know, guys, we printed all this money. We borrowed all this money. We can't pay you back. We just simply cannot pay you back. But we have farmland, we can work some things off. We have ag land, we can, we can supply the world with fruits and vegetables, whatever it is. We can pay back somehow. You know, I, I was always hoping he'd do that, but again, that's idealistic. It's, it's never really going to happen, but it is something that, you know, the world wants to, wants to see. I, I do think they're tired of the U.S. Um, basically giving us, giving the world paper while the world gives the U.S. Ro real things. Well, I think what um, every country, including the U.S., to pay off their debt, they just inflate their debt. So they take out 20 trillion. I think we're 20 trillion in debt, right, in the United States. So it's worth 20 trillion today. Like that's a lot of money. But then they do Venezuelan type hyperinflation, make the debt worthless. Do you think that's basically what they're trying to do? I think it's going to get to that. I mean, like I said, idealistically, you know, you should just have some leader of a country come on and say, you know what, we, we're in bad shape, but we, we want to make things right, but it's never going to happen. So, yes, I do think they are going to try and inflate the debt away. And along with that, as they inflate it, you and me, we're all going to feel some pain and we're probably going to be asking them for some type of monetary solution. And when you look at history, a lot of countries who inflated or hyperinflated, they created a new currency, and that's how they came back. So when you look at the U.S., when you look at us or the world, we already have central bank digital currency. So it's like that's waiting in the wings. Once that inflation hits and everybody's hurting, then that currency is, is right there waiting. So what do you think uh, Americans, the average day American or average day person, you know, who lives in the world, what do you think they can do to bring governments back to the gold standard? What do you think we can do? With um, politicians, I would just say you can't keep reelecting the same bunch. You know, you, you just can't. There should be term limits, but there never is going to be term limits. So, I mean, think about new people who have the same values and ideas as you. Uh, think about things again like gold and silver. And, um, you know, I think those are our key because uh, what I tell people is, you know, we, we have auto insurance, home insurance, life insurance, fire insurance, but what do we have is money insurance. We, we don't have anything, but that is what gold and silver is and to some degree, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin. So we need to find like-minded people and we need to support them. If they're willing to stick their neck out for us, like how you are, we need to support you. And same with politicians, we need to support politicians who, who have, you know, who think the same as we do. And um, the toilet's got to be flushed. You know, 
all of that bad water has, has got to leave and we got to put new water in it. Yeah, I definitely agree with that. Do you know of any politician who's working for the gold standard today? I think uh, Alex Mooney, I think is his name from West Virginia. I think he's one of them. Uh, I do see some states who are acknowledging that uh, gold and silver can be used as money, I believe. There's a few states. Um, but the movement, it's, it's just not there yet. Uh, but thankfully, we do have guys you know, like Wall Street Silver who are coming on the scene, who are trying to wake up the younger crowd. Uh, us older guys, you know, we're, we're supporting them. We're also watching them. And, and I think we realize you know, we've done or we're, we're going to do as much as we can, but it's really got to be the younger people. And, and it's uh, some ways where younger people like their cryptocurrency. They're not so much interested in gold and silver. But at the same time, we have to help educate how these two actually can work together. It doesn't have to be one or the other. The two can work together. So do you know um, they do tax cryptocurrencies, don't they? I know if, if not so much yet, I know they are going to, because again, these are regulations that, that were going through Congress. And it does seem to me, I don't know if you agree with me, but you know, I was just reading about Coinbase and how they're like, um, I think it was a billion dollars they're worth now or something to that effect. And they're, um, and they're basically the crypto exchange. So do you think these coin exchanges, um, you know, crypto exchanges are starting to act as banks almost? I think um, I think in some ways, yes, but um, it's also because they're being regulated. Uh, they, they are, you know, getting, I mean, it's hammered down on them right now. You do see Congress again, you know, trying to pass more and more regulations for these cryptocurrencies. Before, you could just open an account, and now it's, um, if you're in the U.S., you can't open an account, or, or you need all of this, you know, uh, hold up your, 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 your face and your, you know, your, your card, your paper that says it's you and the date and things like that. And, and, um, you know, I don't think it's, I don't think the exchanges really want to do these things, but I do think they are being, they are being asked to do these things. So um, yeah, they are doing yeah. what you said for Coinbase. I believe you need to show your driver's license now and everything. And, uh, one thing that I thought was kind of odd, I don't know if you saw it, but uh, on PayPal, they were making this offer like, um, you know, for people to buy crypto saying, if you buy $10 worth of crypto, uh, $10 or no, if you buy crypto, we'll give you $10 worth of crypto as well. You can buy any amount first time. So it just seemed like a way to get people in to buying crypto. So why do you think PayPal is promoting crypto all of a sudden and giving people, you know, that? You know, that that's a good question. Um, you know, really, the only thing I can think of is when when COVID came along, what it did was it forced pretty much forced everyone to make their payments electronically online, things like that. So I think, you know, uh, it may be just a marketing tool for PayPal, because, again, everything has to pretty much be done online now. And, and they know, you know, Bitcoin is it's always been a big thing. So, you know, maybe it's just a type of a marketing tool to try and get people to use their products now i've seen a lot of movies like i don't know if you heard of the matrix and a whole bunch of other different movies of basically yeah. you know putting people in the digiverse so do you think crypto currency is basically one of the first steps into moving people like more online more on the computer staring at a screen uh yeah do you think that's true yeah i do um Crypto, it's it's an easy way for everybody to trade. Um, so that's one thing. And then I do think in combination with social media, uh, with things like Reddit forums, things like that, um, it's just taken, it's become its own creature. You know, it, it, it's become its own monster. And, um, you know, it's, it's a new economy right now. And it's something a lot of older guys can't really seem to understand, including myself, but, but it's there. You know, this is the new economy a meme economy it's where we're at right now no i was i did a video with uh andy schickman and he was uh mentioning that china was actually making a digital currency uh yeah. and then they're basically kind of requiring people to join it right now um they're giving like some like monetary benefits or something so what do you yeah. think of china's digital currency yeah um yeah you are correct there they they created um 
a, a digital, digital currency for the people. And then they gave out so much free, uh, free coins, I guess, of that digital currency. And, um, you know, but China has been digital for years already uh, with things like WeChat on their mobile phone. They've been cashless for quite a while. I mean, they've made wow. cashless transactions for, for quite a long time already. So something like this for China, it's, it's just a natural, natural uh, evolutionary thing. It's, it's a natural place for, for them to go into. I mean, they were on their phones with WeChat and now the government comes with the cryptocurrency and, you know, it's, it's just a natural thing for China. It, I think people don't fully realize how far ahead China is right now. Wow. So do you think, uh, so China is not really using like physical Chinese dollars very much anymore? Uh, wait, sorry, you, you broke up a bit. Uh, so China is not really using physical, you know, Chinese dollars anymore? Well, they, they still have it. But from what I understand, and even Jim Rogers will, will tell you that, even as something as simple as an ice cream cone, you know, you, you just don't pay cash anymore. You, you will go ahead and transfer money from, from your phone. And again, people, they're just used to non-cash payments. They do have cash still. They, they didn't take it away but people are more accustomed to not using cash. Wow. So is the Chinese government able to take, um, you know, someone's Chinese cryptocurrency away from them if they feel they're not, you know, doing what the government says? You know, I, I can't tell you with a hundred percent certainty, but I, I think it's already well documented that, you know, within China, you do have things like social scores. Um, if you post things on social media that perhaps the government doesn't like, uh, you may, may perhaps get some points. And then if you get too much points, you may not be able to use the internet or if you have um, outstanding debt, things like that, you may not be able to travel. So, you know, it, it is being used in, in some way where um, there's a bit of power that they, they will use on, on their people. Uh, some people will say it's, it's just be responsible. You know, if, if you're responsible, you have nothing to worry about. So it just depends. It just depends on your view of things. So do you think cryptocurrency is going to be used to make uh, something known as an outdoor prison? Outdoor prison? Mm. Okay, crypto. Okay, how, sorry, how, how can I, uh, cryptocurrencies as an outdoor prison? Yeah, so what I'm, what I'm asking is basically since they're able to, you know, track and trace everything you do with uh, cryptocurrency. And so, and, you know, like you were saying, the Chinese government yeah. can take it. Do you think they're yeah. going to use it as part of the, an outdoor prison? And an outdoor prison is basically where you can walk outside, but if you do anything wrong, you know, yeah. you know, you can't do it. So, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. It, I mean, I think people don't realize, but um, I think we are actually headed to a place where we have financial walls and these are going to be the, the prison or the walls to the prison. I mean, again, I can go back to, I think it was Obama, and, and I'm not knocking him as a president, just saying what happened during his term. To renounce your U.S. citizenship was $400 at one point. And then overnight, it became like 2500 to renounce your citizenship. Wow. And a lot of people can't afford that. So what happened was he just put up a financial wall. If you don't have the money, you're not leaving. You're staying put. And why do you have to stay put? Because there's a debt that needs to be worked off perhaps. So don't want people running out and the people that come in, you want to keep them in to help pay down the debt. So yes, I think these things absolutely can be a type of a financial prison wall. I guess you could say it that way. That actually brings me to my next question. Do you believe the United States government is a corporation? a great question I, I tell you what if they're not they surely do act like one and and i think you're probably referring to um i forget the date but the the u.s was taken over at, to be a corporation or something like that I've, I've heard i've heard that um that that theory as well uh but like i say if it's not a corporation yet it it, it surely acts like one and i think even more so now where you have washington dc which is I guess what they're talking about becoming a state still fenced off. Um, yeah, looks like a corporation to me. They're really trying to uh, separate themselves from the people now. 
So what do you think Washington, D.C. and, you know, the Chinese government, you know, the American government, what do you think they're planning on doing within the next 10 years to like 2030? Well, I think the first thing is um, I, I think there is going to be a struggle for power. And, and I'll tell you why, because let's say even if, if U.S., China, Europe, everybody's all friends, everything is all good. It's just human nature. Somebody's going to want to have power. I mean, you think of uh, two corporations when they merge and the two CEOs, you know, they're both thinking who's going to have power. One of them is going to want power. So, you know, if you're looking long term, a decade or so from now, I, I think you're going to try and have that peaceful moment, you know, where things are going to try to be smoothed over. But I think eventually things are going to bubble up. I, I mean, the West. The thinking in the West is just too different from the thinking in, in Asia. I mean, you know, Asia, for the most part, you know, freedoms and all of that, uh, it, it's, it's not there. I mean, basically, people, they, they have a conformist mindset. It's for the good of, of all, not for the individual, which in some ways can be a good thing. And then you have the West, which is freedom, individuality. And so these two things can't I, you just can't really get them yeah. to mix so yeah. so i don't right so there's no wrong no right it's just these things are very very difficult to mix yeah so um how are things in singapore well it's mixed <laughs> i can tell you that we we have um it's very cosmopolitan a um, lot of western values a lot of eastern values and um you know here it works and and because people, they just want to live out their life, do the best they can. Uh, Singapore doesn't have any interest in being a superpower, so therefore it doesn't have the, the, same, um, the same things to deal with as a China would or a U.S. would. But, you know, Singapore, it, it is a country where you are responsible for what you, you do. You know, um, the government is responsible as well for what it does. And it's found that in, in a small island, it has to be this way. People have to be responsible for what they do. Um, and, uh, you know, if you are, then there are a lot of benefits to be had. Taxes are low. Uh, the jurisdiction is a good jurisdiction. Um, Singapore is a financial hub. So, you know, it's, it, it has a lot, of, a lot of pluses that perhaps the state's may not have, perhaps China may not have. And a lot of it has to do because it is a small country and it is a place where, you know, people understand, you know, we, we can't have all of these differences divide us. It, it has to be a strength. Okay. Yeah, it is more of a neutral area. Hong Kong kind of used to be the neutral area, but that's kind of going away, right? <laughs> yeah, Hong Kong, um, I tell you, it's, you know, it, it, the writing was on the wall decades back. I mean, everybody knew that, you know, China was going to take over. So, you know, it shouldn't be a, a surprise. It, everybody knew it. Yeah, definitely. So what are your thoughts on the 2030 agenda? 2030 agenda, which is, let me see. Uh, 20, this one's got to do with what depopulation or, or yeah, it's globalization a, or yeah. Depopulization, globalization kind of the green new deal type thing too in it what are your yeah. thoughts on it well I, I tell you what alexander um it'll get there you know i i don't think this is just some fictitious thing uh, i think it really is the agenda uh, just look at where we are every compass is pointed in in that direction right now you know whether it's the green new deal um they want to get us off of oil oil Half of oil is, is accounted for by transportation. So if you start bringing in electric vehicles, uh, you start to reduce oil. Uh, you look at homes, they're going to try and build power banks in the walls. So they're not going to be using so much um, uh, power from, from, from uh, electric companies and things like that. It, they're trying to cut back on a lot of things. And, and of course, they are well, going to tax uh, carbon taxes, things like that. It, it definitely, for my generation, it's a big change, but for your generation, you, you grew up in a culture of, of a community where, you know, you may not need to own a car. You can just call Uber or, you know, a company like that. 
uh, you may not even need to buy a home. There may be community shelters at, at some point. Um, you know, it's, it, it's, it's just changing quite a bit. And, and the way you look at the 2030 where, you know, World Economic Forum even says you will own nothing and be happy. Wow. You, you look at things like um, NFTs, these non fungible what is non fungible tokens? You, you wow. don't really own anything, but you're happy. And in some cases, some guys might even argue Bitcoin. You don't really own anything, but you're happy. And so we, we see so, this shift. So basically, the World Economic Forum will not, at least according to their papers, will not want to allow gold and silver to be a thing because they don't want anybody to own anything. You know, that, that's a great question. I think um, something's going to happen to that monetary system before the whole 2030 thing pans out. So we'll, we'll find out. Whatever that, whatever that is. Uh, but the, again, the thing to always keep in mind is when you look at people in the IMF, um, I never voted for any of them. Neither did you. And we don't vote for these people, but they're dictating world economies, what's going to happen. Again, World Economic Forum, I never voted for anyone in there, but yet they're sort of creating policy for the rest of the world. So you got to kind of wonder who are these guys, and they're not accountable to any one of us. Yeah, exactly. So how do you think we can stop the 2030 agenda? Wow. Um, that's a tough question. I, I, I think with the way the media is right now, um, they're just going to push that narrative for 2030 agenda and without telling you exactly what it is, but making the elements of whatever it is to seem like the right thing to do. And they will push that narrative and get people on board. And, and uh, next thing you know, you're, you're going to take it all hook, line and sinker without even knowing. Do you think if we can uh, make uh, try to implement the gold standard again, that will stop the 2030 agenda? You know, I think, um, I don't know if it would stop it, but but I do think you know it would it would at least help us to be able to put ourselves in a better position uh, financially as this whole wealth transfer you know really unfolds. Um, it may not be the answer to everything, but I think for you and me and for a lot of individuals, uh, it is the answer to to get ahead and position themselves in a better place as all of these things really really start to unfold at a more rapid pace yeah i think at the very least it would allow them allow not allow these banks to make money out of nothing anymore so at least they wouldn't be because there's a big wealth gap like people say oh these are self-made people they were able to make all this all this money become yeah. multi-billionaires but even during the french monarchy the king didn't even have that much money because he was forced to be on the gold standard so I think if we did, I think we went back on the gold standard, it would at least take away a lot of the, these bankers buying power, a lot of their, you know, purchasing power take away from it. You yeah, agree? yeah, I, I agree. It would, it would. And at the same time, guys like you and me, the average Joe, it's an opportunity for us where we can, we can also get ahead. Yeah, definitely. So is there anything else you'd like to add? Um, well, Hope I didn't put my foot in my mouth too many times here, <laughs> but um, it was a it was a joy speaking with you, and um, I, I can see you really got a bright future ahead. I expect to see you in Congress one day. Oh well, thank you. Uh, can you uh, tell all the viewers where they can find you? Yeah, we I um I host a, a YouTube channel, Silver Bullion Television, uh, SBTV, and we are part of Silver Bullion. Private Limited over in Singapore. We are a bullion company that specializes in wealth protection, systemic wealth protection. So we 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 agree with what's going on, you know, as far as um all of these things and and you know uh, the way central banks are not being responsible and and we see how you know people people need options. People need options, and so it, it's what we focused on as as a bullion dealer to look more in systemic wealth protection and that is uh www.silverbullion.com.sg okay yeah we'll definitely leave that link down in the description and uh thank you for being on the show
Thanks, Alex. Appreciate it. You, I got to tell you, my man, I don't really get nervous with anyone else, but I'm definitely nervous with you. <laughs> okay. Well, um, thank you to the viewer who watched this video. Thank you for watching it on the freeamericanpress.com. And thank you again, Patrick. And uh, thank you to everyone. Thank you also, Alex. Best of luck in the future.